All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, today I wanted to talk to you about the gas giants of our solar system, and uh, then on the next time we're going to move into the moons of those planets. Before we do that, though, I wanted to take a little tour of our outer solar system using Celestia, uh, just to give us an idea of what these objects look like. So now what we've been talking about up until now is uh, how the solar system is formed and we talked about the the distribution of material in the solar system and in our solar system at any rate there are rocky planets uh, in the inner part of the solar system and these planets called gas giants in the outer part of the solar system and we thought that was the way it was everywhere it turns out that a lot of solar systems their gas giants have migrated in to the inner solar system through some kind of interaction with the disk of material that was forming those planets at the time. Uh, either that did not happen in our solar system or it happened uh, and then uh, the, the planet, the gas giants, eventually got engulfed by the sun and some more formed further out. Or there's an idea out there that the gas giants migrated in for a while and then through scattering of other large objects migrated back out. Uh, but regardless of what happened, at least in our solar system, we've got rocky planets on the inner part of the solar system and uh, uh, gaseous planets on the outside. So here we are at the Earth. Let's go ahead and move out to uh, Jupiter, our first gas giant. And if you haven't downloaded Celestia yet, it's kind of a fun program to mess around with. You can fly around to uh, there's Jupiter right there. Now you'll notice as I zoom in there's all these little objects around Jupiter right here and here and here. Those are the moons of Jupiter, what are called the Galilean moons because those were first discovered by Galileo. Uh, and Jupiter the planet is a gas giant and you can see them you right off the top of the bat that it's significantly different from the rocky planets. Uh, it frankly it has more in common with a star than it does with a planet. Its composition is primarily hydrogen and helium uh, not rock or ice like our, our planets are. Um, it also is a mini solar system all by itself. If I uh, run this thing forward in time uh, let's go see if we can watch this move around. So I'm just letting this go forward in time as we sit on Jupiter and you can see these moons uh, right here. Here comes the moon that looks like Callisto. You can see that moon rotating around Jupiter and these moons orbit like it's just a little mini solar system. Uh, the other thing we see about the planet Jupiter is that it has these beautiful bands of different types of gases that condense in the atmosphere, these different cloud bands, and so we have, uh, we have a planet that really is fundamentally different from uh, an Earth-like planet. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. Okay, so that's Jupiter. Um, there are a bunch of moons of Jupiter that we could uh, that we're going to talk about a little bit later. I just want to show them to you while we're out here. There's the closest moon in which is called Io. And Io is the most volcanically active moon in the solar system. This moon is so volcanically active that every single time we look at it it looks a little bit different. Um, just because all of these little black spots and yellow spots and white spots are volcanoes that are constantly erupting. Now the reason that it's so volcanically active is because the gravitational influence of the planet Jupiter needs the planet-like dough it, uh, through its tidal interactions and that causes the internal heat to, to rise and so we get this very um, geologically active world. Uh, there's also a planet or a moon called Europa which is the second moon out in Jupiter's system and Europa is unique in that it has a liquid water crust on it. You can see here this crust that has all these cracks in it and uh, uh, we know spectroscopically that it's made of liquid water but because again because the tidal heating from Jupiter the subsurface of this ice uh, underneath this ice is liquid water and uh, I'll show you some more evidence for why we think there's a liquid water ocean on Europa and in fact it's the largest liquid water ocean in the solar system. Um, so Europa is an interesting place to think about going to look for life because if water is the one requirement for life then uh, Europa has plenty of it. It just happens to be beneath this icy crust. Uh, the other thing is these dark red sort of uh, uh, channels on the surface of Europa are full of uh, organic material and so you've got organic material on there, you've got water ice, you've got liquid water uh, so it's a great place uh, potentially to look for life. Uh, a couple of other uh, moons of Jupiter are Ganymede 
There's Ganymede. Let's go around and look at the sunlit side. So you can see this is all the perspective. You can see what Jupiter looks like uh, from these different moons. And Ganymede is, uh, again, ice, primarily water ice in composition, at least on the surface. But it's further from Jupiter. It's less influenced by the tidal heating of Jupiter. And therefore, it has an icy crust, but we don't think it has a liquid water ocean. You can also tell that the crust is a lot uh, more uh, durable. It doesn't have as many cracks in it because you see all these craters on the surface, which tells us that it hasn't been modified much. Uh, since those craters hit it. Uh, so this is, a, as again, as we march out further from Jupiter, we're sort of seeing a, a decrease in the internal heat of the moons, uh, giving rise to different surface properties. And then the last one I want to show you is Callisto, which is the furthest large moon out uh, from the solar, or from Jupiter. And Callisto looks like it's even less geologically active than the other moons. And you can see it's much smoother. It has lots more craters on it. Um, again, uh, ice surface, but you're not seeing the same sort of internal heat. Uh, to give some perspective, these moons are planet size. I mean, they're large. some of them are larger than, uh, or at least the same size as the planet Mercury. If they were orbiting our sun, we would call them planets, but they're orbiting Jupiter, so we call them moons. Uh, but they are particularly interesting places in the solar system. Okay, so that's Saturn, and we'll come back and talk about that in detail. Or sorry, that's Jupiter. We'll talk about that in detail. Let's go look at Saturn. Uh, and Saturn is one of those beautiful objects in the solar system. And if you ever get a chance to go outside and look at Saturn uh, with a telescope, it's uh, pretty amazing. It looks like it's just been painted on uh, the telescope. And this is uh, all of this imagery I'm showing you is from the. Uh, uh, robotic explorers that have been around these planets. And you can see the first thing that strikes you about Saturn is this beautiful ring system. Now all the outer moons have ring systems, but Saturn is the only one that is as bright uh, as, as this. And that's primarily because of the composition of the material of the rings. The rings on all the outer planets are made up of little tiny dust grains and small little particles, uh, but the ones around Saturn happen to be particularly reflective um, because of their composition. And you can see it has all these moons. Um, you'll notice it has these bands similar to Jupiter, uh, and those bands uh, we'll talk about in a minute why they're not quite as distinct as the planet Jupiter, uh, but we do see similar structures. Uh, Saturn's a little bit less massive than uh, Jupiter, and because it's made out of gas, it's uh, compressible. So if it's less massive, it's actually a little puffier. So its density is, is pretty low. Its density is actually less than the density of water. So that's, the, that's Saturn. Let's take a look at just one moon around Saturn that's of interest, uh, which is the moon Titan. And Titan is a, uh, a moon of Saturn which has a significant atmosphere. And you'll notice that just by looking at it because Titan has no observable surface features, right? You can just see this sort of thick atmosphere. The atmosphere is about one and a half times the atmosphere we see on the Earth. Uh, it's made out of nitrogen. And in fact, if you were to take the Earth and haul it out to Saturn's distance, uh, this is pretty much what it would look like. So it's an interesting experiment. It's basically saying, what would Earth be like if it formed out in the outer solar system? And there you can see what Saturn looks like uh, from the perspective of Titan. Uh, we're going to come back to Titan and talk about it as well because it's one of the f uh, only other system planets in our solar system, moons in our solar system, that has a fluidological cycle on the surface, except the fluid isn't water, the fluid is methane. Uh, and we'll talk more about that uh, when we get to the moons. Uh, those are the, uh, the two largest outer planets, Jupiter and Saturn. If we go further out, we get to a planet called Neptune. And Neptune is kind of halfway between, well, we used to say Neptune was about halfway between Jupiter and the Earth. It turns out there are these sub-Neptune super-Earth planets that we don't have an example of in our solar system. Um, but it is a, uh, uh, it's kind of a hybrid between a gas giant and an Earth-like planet. So here's what Neptune looks like. Neptune is blue because it has a lot of methane in its atmosphere that absorbs all the red light. And so all we really see is the reflected blue light. Um, if you play around with this in Celestia, you can see a very faint ring around Neptune. Um, you can see it does have those same sorts of banded structures. Again, it's mostly blue just because of all the methane. It has clouds at the surface. Um, it even has uh, the equivalent of a giant storm here. You can see this kind of big black spot here. Um, 
and Neptune is uh, primarily hydrogen and helium, uh, but it does have a rocky, icy core. Um, there's the, the real debate is whether or not it has a surface to speak of. Um, we don't think uh, Neptune has a surface that is more of a, a gradual transition between the inner core and the outer atmosphere, uh, but at some point if you make Neptune smaller there has to be some place where that changes, and because we've never seen these sub-Neptune super-Earth planets up close, we're not sure exactly what that is. Uh, but it's one of the more beautiful planets in our solar system uh, just because of that deep blue color. Now if you want to go look at uh, another Neptune class planet in our solar system up close is a planet called Uranus and Uranus is about the same size as Neptune it's about the same mass um, it's a little bit colder so it has a slightly different atmospheric structure and looks a little bit different uh, on its surface you can still see these faint bands uh, but it has a general greenish blue cast again because of that methane in the atmosphere and you probably can't see it on your screen but there's some very faint rings around Uranus and a bunch of moons around Uranus as well. Um, and if we get a chance when we get to the moons we'll talk about some of the moons of, of Uranus. So those are sort of the general classes. We have the Earth-like planets, we have the gas giant giant planets like Jupiter and Saturn, we have the sub-giant gas planets like Neptune and Uranus. And just for the sake of completeness um, I'm gonna go take whoop, take a picture of Jupiter or Pluto what happened to my thing here? Let's go back here. Let's take a look at Pluto. So this is the planet Pluto. This is the one planet, and I know it's not technically a planet, but I still call it a planet because uh, I grew up that way. Uh, but Pluto is the one planet we've never really seen a detailed surface uh, photos of, and that's just because we've never sent a probe directly to Pluto. That's all going to change in the next few years. Uh, new Frontiers, or New Horizons, is flying out to pass uh, Jupiter as a or Pluto as a flyby, and it will be taking high resolution images as it goes past. So that's all going to change here in a little bit. Uh, now, Pluto is different from the other three classes of planets we talked about. It's really just a big ice ball, um, debris left over from the formation of the outer solar system. Uh, so it sort of fits into this whole category of, uh, of the spectrum of planets, from our rocky planets to our sub-Neptunes to our Neptunes to our Jupiters. And uh, one of the big studies of exoplanet research is trying to figure out how all these things fit together. John. Yeah. If we're sending a probe out um, based on current technology, how long would it take before we actually saw pictures? So, yeah, so it, um, so for, for Pluto, uh, Pluto, we've launched New Horizons, gosh, I want to say almost 12 years ago, and it's going to get there in the next couple years. So to get out to the outer solar system, and, and this one that's going to Pluto is cruising. It's not going to slow down. It's just going as fast as it possibly can to get out there. And uh, it, uh, it takes, you know, a decade and a half or more to get all the way out there. And then it has, it's, it'll take, uh, you know, maybe 500 pictures as it flies by, and then that's it. It just heads out of the solar system. Um, Jupiter and, and Saturn, we wanted to send something that we could keep in orbit around them, so we had to be a little more careful about that, and some of those missions took 15 years to get out there. Once they're out there, though, the uh, imagery only takes a few hours to get back, because the images can travel at the speed of light, and our, our, our other uh, craft are really going much slower than that. So when New Horizons passes Pluto, we'll get the pictures back right away, effectively. So you will be able to see that uh, in the next few years. In fact, while we're on the subject, let me just bring up uh, New Horizons and check what their status is. So the status of this mission to Pluto is, uh, let's see here, they've got a little countdown here. Um, the mission elapsed time is almost 3,000 days, and the first close encounter uh, occurs in 422 days. So a little bit over a year from now will be the first encounter and uh, it's been flying for almost 10 years now. So it's pretty uh, it's pretty remarkable uh, how long it takes to get out there. But that I'm excited about because we've never seen, really seen the surface of Pluto up close. We've only taken high resolution Hubble Space Telescope pictures of it. Alright, so let's take a little time talking about the gas giants in 
detail, and then we'll save the moons for next time uh, because they're uh, they're an interesting subject all by themselves. Um, if you go to your textbook and look at the data on these planets, um, there's a lot of information here, but I, I just want you to pause for a moment and think about uh, what we've been able to accomplish in the last 100 years uh, to gather the data we have on our solar system. If you think about just 100 years ago, every single solar system object was just a point of light or at best a blurry ball in somebody's small telescope. And since that time we've managed to get uh, their accurate distances, their masses, their densities, measure their compositions. We've sent probes to the uh, to orbit them. Uh, we've landed probes on some of the moons of these outer planets and uh, really done an amazing amount of discovery, uh, especially considering it takes decade or more to get out there to study it. Uh, so it's, it's a kind of a testament to human achievement that we've been able to do this in such a relatively short period of time. And, uh, and we're just lucky to have such a diverse collection of things to look at because we've learned a lot. Uh, some interesting things about Jupiter, that's the biggest planet and, and the one we've had the best telescopic measurements for for the longest time. Um, I found out when I was in graduate school that we first started learning about weather on Earth by studying weather patterns on Jupiter. And this was before we had satellites orbiting the Earth. We could look at Jupiter and look at the cloud patterns and get to understand how cloud patterns worked and then apply that knowledge to storm systems on the Earth and improve our predictions of storms on the Earth, things like hurricanes, before we even had satellites on the Earth to tell us what was going on. So we've used these objects to really learn a lot about our solar system and about the Earth. Uh, this image is showing you just in perspective form the uh, the relative sizes of these things and you can see that Jupiter and Saturn there's kind of an equivalence here they're pretty much close to the same size Uranus and Neptune are pretty close to the same size here's the Earth for comparison and again I just want to put on here there are these objects out there called super Earths that are about this size that we don't have in our solar system and so what we would like to understand is how, what, how does this spectrum of planet formation work? Why do we have these apparently different classes? Is it a complete spectrum? Can you have a planet of any size? Or are there things that happen that say once you get over a Saturn mass, you, uh, you know, you're going to be a Jupiter or Saturn, or once you get over a certain mass, you'll be a Uranus or a Neptune? Um, the interesting thing about uh, gas giants, though, is that the more massive they are, the denser they are. And that's because they are compressible. Gas, unlike rock or, or fluid, is, is compressible. So if you get up to a certain size, the planet starts to shrink in size. And so you can see the densities here. If you look at Saturn, uh, Saturn is 100 times the mass of the Earth. Jupiter is 300 times the mass of the Earth. And you see the density of Saturn's 70% of water. And the density of Jupiter is 1.3 times the density of water. So there's some different properties that come into play when we talk about these gas planets. Um, for the most part, Jupiter and Saturn are hydrogen and helium, so they have more in common with stars than they do with planets uh, like the Earth. They, they have uh, mostly hydrogen and helium gas inside of them. And so the, you could almost think of Jupiter and Saturn as failed stars. If they were a little bit bigger, Jupiter in particular, if Jupiter was about 10 times to 100 times bigger, it would ignite into a star. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that, that's, you couldn't really do that with the Earth. Um, but you could just add a little bit of mass to Jupiter, relatively speaking, and get a star. Uh, Uranus and Neptune are kind of halfway in between. They have this rocky uh, core, we think, right, and some hydrogen compounds like water and methane and things like that uh, that form as ice in the center, and then you have a hydrogen and helium atmosphere. Uh, so again, still predominantly hydrogen and helium, but they have a larger rocky, icy core. This is just a graph showing those density differences of the outer planets. Um, and you can see this, this interesting thing that um, Uranus and Neptune, right? The, ten, the trend we would think is that as you made planets uh, bigger, they would get uh, more dense, right? But you can see that there's sort of this trend here where when you're going from Neptune to Uranus, as you make the planet bigger, you get less dense. And then as you transition from Saturn to Jupiter, you get more dense. And the reason for that is because over here in the Neptune class objects, these guys have less hydrogen and helium. And so they're denser just because they have more rock. So there's some kind of transition here where you transition to something that's mostly hydrogen and helium on this side, which acts like a gas. 
So these are gas giants, true gas giants. And over here you have something that, that's acting like a rock gas mixture and you can see a clear transition. And so the question is, where does that transition occur? How big do you have to be before you get there? Um, is, a, is an interesting question. Now to think about why these planets, once you get past a certain size, start to get denser as you get smaller, uh, or sorry, denser as you get, yeah, denser as you get smaller and more massive, um, you want to think about uh, sort of a picture where you've got pillows, uh, compressible objects uh, on uh, that you're stacking one on top of the other. If you've got compressible objects that you're stacking one on top of the, each other, as you add more, they, the weight of those things compress it further and further and further. And so the size of Jupiter is compressed compared to its mass um, relative to Saturn. So since Saturn has less mass, it's puffier, and because it's puffier, it has less density. Um, it's, a, it's, just, it's a way for, for astrophysicists to tell the difference between a planet that's gas-dominated and a planet that has some rock composition. So what we're doing with the new measurements of the exoplanets is we're looking for these properties. If you find planets that as they get bigger, they get denser uh, and more massive, then we are clearly in a gas giant regime. And if you have planets that as you make them bigger, uh, they get less dense because they have more rocket material inside compared to the gas, then you can see a transition between these two types of planets. And I used to say, you know, a year or two ago that uh, we didn't know anything about exoplanets in this regard, but just this last year at the AAS meeting, uh, they published 63 planets that have known densities now. And so we can begin to do this kind of analysis for exoplanets. So maybe a hundred years from now, I will have data that I can show you about uh, the exoplanets that looks the same. Um, okay, so what do the jo Jovian planets look like on the inside? You know, we can do this by modeling the properties of the materials, right? So if we look at uh, just taking a model of hydrogen and helium and seeing what happens on the inside, uh, we can get a, a distribution of materials. So let's look at uh, the Jovian planets, the giant uh, uh, gas giant planets first. Some of their properties are there's no solid surface, so when you transition as you go down in the planet, it's not like you go through the atmosphere and land on the surface. There's no surface. It just gets denser and denser and denser and denser and denser. Um, all of these layers create higher pressures and temperatures. And if there is a core of anything uh, for something like the Jovian planets, it's about 10 Earth masses right in the very center, primarily made out of methane, ammonia, metals, and rock. Um, and there are different layers on different planets, and we're going to talk about why we see these different layers on different planets. But first, let's look at Jupiter. Uh, Jupiter uh, has, uh, again, mostly hydrogen, 75% by mass. And so we'll just look at that in terms of the state of the hydrogen gas. Uh, as you drop down in pressure, or so you drop down in altitude, you go up in pressure, you pass through the gaseous hydrogen. We think of this as like a typical type of atmosphere. And you will transition smoothly into liquid hydrogen as the pressures increase. It won't be like an ocean where you fall out of the sky and splash into the ocean. It'll just be getting denser and denser and denser until you are now predominantly liquid hydrogen. And then if you keep going down, that same another transition occurs at higher densities where it turns into metallic hydrogen and we call it metallic just because the uh, high pressure and temperature have ripped the electrons off of the hydrogen and so it conducts electricity very well that's the only reason we call it metallic and then that persists for quite a ways all the way down to this core at the center and the core is about the same size as the earth but it's uh, 10 to 20 times the mass and you can see what happens to the pressures you know if we if we take one atmosphere pressure, one bar, which is what we have here on the Earth, we have one bar on the surface of the Earth. Ah. Hang on real quick. Uh, let's see if I can get rid of that over here. I don't know what happened. There we go. Okay. So one bar on the surface of the Earth that's what we see here. Uh, as you go down in temperature goes up, right? and pressure goes up. So as we go down here, we, we start at about 125K, which is about, uh, if you remember that 273K is uh, freezing point, that's zero degrees centigrade, so quite a significantly low temperature. But as you go up, when you get to this point, this is like the surface of the sun, 
So you, <laughs> you get down to this layer where it's 2 million bars and you have a temperature that's near the surface of the sun. As you keep going down, temperature and pressure goes up until you get to something like 100,000 uh, 100 million bars and about 20,000 degrees. This is not enough to fuse uh, elements to create energy like in a star, uh, but it's still pretty hot at the center. And again, we can tell this simply from the, the physical properties of hydrogen helium as you compress them. Now if we look at uh, you know this core down here, this core because it's so compressed is really massive. So this core is relatively small, it's only about an Earth size, but because it's so compressed it's pretty massive. And its density is about 25 times that of water. So again, if you, if you were to throw yourself into Jupiter and fall down through the surface, it would just be, you wouldn't really notice any smooth transition or any sharp transitions, you would just smoothly get more and more pressure and temperature until eventually all of the atoms were stripped out of your body and you were completely obliterated. Um, okay, so that's Jupiter, and that's generally what happens for Saturn as well. Um, most we we think that Saturn and Jupiter have similar interior compositions, but Ju Uranus and Neptune uh, have a slightly different property because it doesn't have the high pressure and temperature. So we don't think you ever get to the metallic hydrogen in those planets. Um, so if you look at a comparison here, um, because of the mass of these of these Jove, or these Uranus and Neptune sized planets, these, uh, these slightly smaller gas planets, we have a gaseous envelope of hydrogen, right? And then we have a uh, water and methane and ammonia material and then a rocky core in the center. And the actual distribution of that is uncertain. You know, we have, it's a lot more complicated than modeling a hydrogen helium uh, uh, planet, and so it's a little bit more uh, of a current area of research to figure out what these planets are like in their interiors. Okay, one of the interesting things about giant planets is that because they're com being compressed by gravity, they have to radiate that energy away somehow. And Jupiter in particular radiates about twice as much energy as it receives from the sun. Um, that, uh, that contraction of this gravitational mass uh, is generating a lot of energy. And that energy just radiates out from the surface and it's, uh, it's released in the form of radiation. And so what that means is that Jupiter is gradually shrinking over time as it radiates this away. And it won't change all that much over the history of the solar system, uh, but it's, it's a uh, computable amount that you can measure the radiation coming out and you can measure the, uh, the decrease. Uh, of the, of the size of Jupiter as it radiates its heat away. So again, that's one of the uh, differences between gas giant planets and other planets like uh, Earth, uh, Earth rocky planets, or even Uranus and Neptune, is that because they're compressible, uh, they're still in that contraction phase. I mean, the Earth is pretty much a rigid body. It's not, com it's not collapsing anymore, uh, whereas Jupiter is. Now, one of the great things about these Jovian planets is you can look at their weather patterns. And this is something, again, when Galileo first pointed his telescope 400 years ago at Jupiter, he saw this thing called the Great Red Spot. And it's a high pressure system on, uh, that you, that's visible from the cloud decks on Jupiter. And this thing has been visible for 400 years, and it hasn't changed all that much. Um, so these weather patterns are amazing. I mean, imagine a, a storm system on the Earth lasting for 400 years. Uh, so we can use this to study weather patterns and study um, the, uh, the flow of gases in an atmosphere. And the reason these weather patterns persist for so long is because there's no solid surface for them to interact with. The reason weather patterns on Earth dissipate is because they move along the surface of the ocean or the, or the, the land, and that friction dissipates the energy and causes them to break up. So we, we don't have that happening on Jupiter, so these systems can last forever. Well, I shouldn't say forever. We don't know how long the red spot has lasted. We know it's lasted at least 400 years. Um, it might last another 400 or it might last another 100 or 1000. It's difficult to say. Uh, but if we look at the atmosphere of Jupiter, uh, we can measure because we know the compression of the planet. We can measure the uh, pressure. And if we know the pressure 
and we can measure the temperature, we can tell what sort of gases will condense out in the form of clouds. Now you're familiar with this on Earth because on Earth we have one, con one condensable material in, this, in the atmosphere, water, and as you go up from the surface the temperature goes down and eventually you get to the point where water clouds can form. Uh, on Jupiter we have a bunch of other types of compounds. We have water, we have methane, we have ammonia, we have this thing which is, uh, I think it's uh, ammonia, sulfur hydrate, something like that. Different com chemical compounds uh, in the surface, uh, in the cloud decks of Jupiter's atmosphere, and they all condense at a different temperature and pressure. So if I have a uh, you know, imagine the temperature, this line is showing the temperature as I'm deep down, I, I'm warm, as I go up here I get colder. If I hit the point that's about 273, so this is about 273, and about, you know, this is a little bit more than one atmosphere, but it's comparable to the type of pressures we would get here on Earth, you know, about a factor of two or three, we get water clouds, right? So this is where the water clouds form, and they'll be white just like our water clouds. Uh, this stuff, this ammonia compound here, uh, it condenses at a slightly lower temperature, so I go up and I get this condensation happening at a slightly lower temperature, and then if I keep going up, I have this other uh, uh, let's see, this is another an ammonia compound here, which condenses at a slightly lower temperature, and I get a different color cloud. So I've got a yellow cloud here, I've got a red cloud here, and I've got a white cloud here. And those different colors are going to show up on our images. And that's why we see things like this, where you see, you know, areas that are, that are lighter, we've got red clouds, we've got these yellow clouds swirling in, and if you want to think about it, you're really seeing in three dimensions. The white clouds are deeper, the yellow clouds are higher, and you're seeing it all swirl together, right, because there are all these different compounds that can condense. Now this should happen in any Jupiter planet, so the question is why does the surface of, or the, the outer atmosphere of Saturn look so different and why do the outer atmospheres of Uranus and Neptune look so different? They, they have these same compounds in there, uh, so why would you get different colors? And it all depends on the temperature profile in the atmosphere and it all depends on how far away from the Sun you are, because the farther away you are from the Sun, the colder it will be in general on your planet. So again, if we look at the, the temperature profiles of these planets, this is Jupiter right here, Jupiter is warmer, it's closer to the Sun, right? So the trend in temperature is going to be at a higher altitude. So you see that for a given temperature we're at a higher altitude. These ammonia hydrosulfide clouds form at the uh, 200 Kelvin mark, so if I go to 200 Kelvin on Jupiter that's way up here and that's higher up in the atmosphere. If I look at Saturn, Saturn I've got to go way down another 200 kilometers almost before I get cold enough or I should say warm enough to uh, to get the same sort of clouds. So these ammonium hydrosulfide clouds happen lower down in the atmosphere of Saturn. And same with the ammonia ones and same with the water ones. So you still get the same cloud sequence, they just happen deeper in the atmosphere. And if you look at something like Uranus and, Uranus and Neptune, in order to get down to you know these cloud decks, uh, we have methane clouds you can see and you get a lot of methane absorption. Uh, we don't really see the ammonia compounds. We should be able to see those. We don't see those and that's primarily because they're locked up in other things. But you have to go really deep down right, to get to the same temperature and you just don't see that deep. So if you look at Jupiter, it's warm, so all the clouds are high up in the atmosphere, so they're easy to see. You go to Saturn, it's a little bit colder, the clouds are deeper in the atmosphere, so they're opaque, they're fuzzed out, you can't really see them all that well. You go out to Uranus and Neptune, those clouds are still there, they're just tucked even deeper into the atmosphere, and the atmosphere is too opaque for us to see them. So the, the, the types of clouds you see tell you the temperature profiles on these planets. Um, and again, when we talk about exoplanets, what makes this so interesting is that as we begin to measure the colors of these planets, uh, you can measure the temperature profile by just looking at what color clouds you see, because the different color clouds are probes for different depths of the atmosphere. And depending on the types of materials that form there, uh, you'll get a whole bunch of different um, uh, different colors and different properties. So these clouds are a way to probe the structure of the atmosphere and tell you what the atmosphere is made out of and what its temperature profile looks like. Um, again, here you can see uh, some of these patterns that show up on Jupiter's clouds. Um, 
we have these uh, and now that you know about uh, ammonia sulfide you can go out and amaze your friends and say hey look check out these ammonia sulfide clouds on Mars they're the ones that reflect sort of red brown so that would be like these guys right here right and these white ones in this picture are ammonia they're yellow white sort of clouds um, the water clouds are the deepest ones in there and usually when you see the white ones on Jupiter you're looking at the ammonia clouds um, we're having trouble finding the amount of water we expect to see on Jupiter. We did launch a probe into the surface to measure water and uh, we didn't measure any but it fell into a hole where there were no water clouds so <laughs> so it'll be interesting to see uh, where the water is but you can see these amazing patterns you know it's like pouring cream in coffee um, these beautiful swirls uh, of, of gas and it's just pretty uh, pretty beautiful stuff. I've known folks who have just printed out these photos and hung them on their wall because they they look like modern art um, and this is a picture of Saturn showing the similar colors but you notice they're kind of fuzzy you can't see them it's not because our resolution of the picture is any worse it's because they're deeper and so those, because those clouds are deeper they're less distinct same cloud deck same materials uh, they're just uh, have to you have to go deeper into Saturn's atmosphere before you get warm enough to get those clouds so they're just more subdued um, so a fun question would be, you know, you could ask yourself, what would uh, Jupiter look like if you moved it closer to the sun? And I think you could argue that it would be more brilliant, more amazing. You'd see more materials condensing, all sorts of stuff uh, in the cloud decks. And some of these exoplanets have Jupiters that are closer to the sun. So uh, it'll be interesting to see what we find uh, as we go out there. Um, let's step back and talk about Uranus and Neptune a little bit they have one more property which dominates the uh, uh, their color they, the thing that gives them that beautiful blue color and that's just uh, the simple uh, large amount of methane in their atmosphere and that methane uh, absorbs uh, red radiation and scatters blue radiation and that's why they are these beautiful blue colors uh, a question about these Neptunes however is uh, when you find these Neptunes that are close into the central star, will they have the same color? And it really just depends on on what they're made out of, right? If uh, if you if you have to be uh, if you're a Uranus and Neptune that forms out past Jupiter, you're methane rich. Maybe if you form closer in, you'll be methane poor. So we don't know what these things will look like if they're closer in, but we're out where they are now, they have this definite uh, blue. Uh, tinge uh, because of uh, because of the amount of methane in the atmosphere but again just by looking at the color you can tell something about the atmosphere of the planet so as we find these things around other stars uh, we'll be looking to see if the Neptunes are blue or not and if they are blue they're like our Neptunes and if they're not blue they must be like something else okay so that's the outer planets and I think in the interest of uh, making sure we don't get into too much in one day let's hold off on the moons until next time.